I have nothing new to teach the world. Truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. All I have done is to experiment in both on a vast scale. This was a quote by Mahatma Gandhi in 1936. The leading question of my presentation today is Gandhi's successful policy of nonviolence, only a strategy for India in the 20th century or a model for contemporary conflicts. The presentation is structured into the following three topics. The first topic is an introduction to the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi. The second one, the Salt March, an exemplary campaign for Gandhi's nonviolent fight for independence. And the third topic, Gandhi's nonviolent methods related to a current political conflict. Mohandas Karamchat Gandhi was born on the 2nd October 1869 in Porbanda, a small town in the West Indian state of Gujarat. He is popularly known as Mahatma. Mahatma is a title conferred to him by the Indian people when he was in his mid-forties, meaning great soul. His mother was deeply religious and exerted influence on Gandhi quite early. After his school time, Gandhi went to London to study law at the university. At this time, he became a member of the Vegetarian Club and the Theosophical Society and started to be interested in questions about diet and different religions. In 1893, Gandhi went to South Africa for work. Originally, he planned to stay not longer than a year. But because of the discrimination he and his fellows were confronted with, he stayed at the end for 21 years in South Africa. As a lawyer, he took up the cause of the Indian contract laborers who were treated badly by the whites. There, he came in contact with publications of Thoreau, Ruskin and Tolstoy and developed step by step a theoretical and practical lifestyle of truth and nonviolence. In addition, he founded the Phoenix Settlement, where members tried to live a simplified life. This was one of Gandhi's first efforts in community life, which finally led to the concept of Savodaya, the welfare of all. Moreover, Gandhi understood that social and political changes cannot be solved through violence and terrorism, but by respect of the opponents and negotiations. In India, the tradition of nonviolence is rooted in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. It is called Ahimsa, the absence of violence. Gandhi's thoughts are originated in the Hindu tradition. Truth and nonviolence, which Gandhi called Satya and Ahimsa, are the keystones in Gandhi's philosophy. Truth is the eternal basic principle in all lives. After his engagement for the rights for Indians in South Africa, he returned together with his family to India in 1915. He became the leader of the independence movement and gradually worked for independence from the British Empire, of which India was a colony at that time. At the same time, he worked for a reform of the Indian society. Searching for God, nonviolence and self-control are inseparable for Gandhi. Instead, they belong together and form a whole lifestyle which Gandhi called Satyagraha, meaning the power of truth. In Satyagraha, religion and everyday life, thinking and acting are not separated. The ultimate aim was the pursuit of truth. For Gandhi, it was equal with seeing God face to face. In addition, Gandhi adopted for himself Brahmacharya, which literally means the way to God. In order to focus on these aims, one must keep control over his senses and bodily organs as well. This includes, for example, control over food intake and sexual abstinence. Gandhi did not see himself as a politician, but as a social worker who puts the service of his fellow beings in the center. Furthermore, he was against untouchability and gave the untouchables the name Harijans, literally meaning the children of God. Harijans were people who were considered outcast and untouchable because they were only allowed to do dirty and unclean work such as cleaning toilets, 
killing animals or leather works. Also, he worked for the emancipation of women. Gandhi wanted them to take part in the struggle of independence and he wanted them to be treated equally. For Gandhi, the political freedom of India, which he called Swaraj, was a consequence of the personal freedom of the individuals, which is bound in the eternal pursuit of the truth. His most famous campaign was the Salt March, which brought him world publicity in 1930. Afterwards, negotiations with the British Empire led to India's independence in 1947, where British India got divided into the Islamic State of Pakistan and India. Just six months after that, Gandhi was assassinated by a Hindu fanatic on 30th January 1948. Now I come to my second topic. Gandhi started a march with 79 Congress volunteers to achieve the breach of the salt law. Although the overall aim of Gandhi's political activities was to achieve independence for India from the British Empire, the primary aim of the Salt March was the abolition of the salt law in India. At that time, England had the monopoly to produce salt. Salt was an essential commodity, especially for the poor farmers who formed the majority of the country. The secondary aim of the Salt March was to reform the Indian society. It was manifested in the constructive program, which was declared by Gandhi. The Salt March started on the 12th March 1930 from Ahmedabad and ended on the 4th April 1930 at Dandi, a coastal town in South Gujarat. For Gandhi, the Salt March was conducted in a non-violent way, where he also taught his non-violent army to react without using violence, no matter what happened. So, non-violence was not a mere tactic, but a way of life. Gandhi and his non-violent army worked from village to village to create awareness for the aims of the Salt March. For this, they held gatherings in the villages which they passed through. Gradually, the march gained attention by the Indian public and turned to a mass movement. On the 5th April 1930, Gandhi picked up a handful of natural salt from the beach of Dandi. By this, he symbolically broke the salt law. It led to an uprising in the whole country and salt was manufactured illegally in India everywhere. A few days after, Gandhi was arrested and the leadership of the Salt March went to Sarojini Naidu, a famous singer and poetess in India. She took the non-violent army to a site where salt was manufactured in order to occupy the factories. The non-violent army tried to occupy the salt pans without violence, but were beaten up by the British army brutally. By that time, the Salt March received worldwide attention and the newspapers all over reported about its progress. The campaign spread like wildfire. 200,000 people got imprisoned. As a result of the Salt March, India was allowed to produce its own salt. In addition, Gandhi tried to reform the Indian society and prepare his people for independence. For that, Gandhi created a constructive program, which included the equal treatment of minorities and decentralization of industries, which leads to economic equality. Moreover, his aim was the equal treatment of women, as well as the development of local crafts, spinning and weaving, in order to get independent from British products. The constructive program also included the regulation of alcohol consumption and to improve sanitation. Gandhi wanted to reform the Indian caste system. At that time, it was an unjust vertical system. He wanted to turn the caste system into a horizontal system, where professions are on the same level and equal to each other. The value of a farmer is of the same value as a mechanic or a dentist or a lawyer. The constructive program was a much more difficult task to achieve than the mere achievement of independence. However, in today's India, we find a number of these points realized and they led to a more humane society. As example, Gandhi initiated the foundation of labor unions. 
In addition, Gandhi's thoughts had an important impact of the role of women. Outside India, a number of movements were influenced by Gandhi and led to social, political and economic changes in various parts of the world. Now I come to my third topic where I present you the pros and cons of the fact that Gandhi's opponent was the British Empire before I come to the main third topic. One pro is that because of the World War II, the British Empire was weakened and gradually gave up its colony. Another pro is that in the early 1940s, the Hindus, the Muslims and the British had very different positions in the question of independence. Gandhi, being an integrative personality, was the only one who was accepted by all the three parties in the negotiations, which finally led to a rather smooth way in the independence process. Another pro is that Lord Louis Mountbatten, the last British viceroy in India, was a great sympathizer of Gandhi and shared a good relationship with him. England, being a democracy, had a strong opposition party, which was in favor of the Indian cause. In a dictatorship, that would not have been possible. The British were used to fair play and at the later stage, they accepted Gandhi as a partner on negotiations on equal terms. Due to a certain amount of sympathy on both sides, Gandhi could use fasting as means of last resort in the struggle. But fasting only works if the opponent has some empathy towards a fasting person. Now I come to my cons. India was divided in several movements and for a long time did not agree upon a common strategy in the fight for independence. The British applied their old practice of divide and rule and achieved that British India got divided into India and Pakistan. During the independence process, both countries fought a war where about 500,000 people died. These pros and cons give the impression that it was comparatively easy for Gandhi to achieve independence from the British Empire. But history shows that in other political systems it is possible to apply non-violence in order to achieve political, social and economic changes too. That has been proven by various polls done in 1999, where the personalities of the 20th century were declared. A part of Mahatma Gandhi, those were Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Mother Theresa, Mark Gorbachev, Lech Valenza, former Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, and Aung San Suu Kyi. They all called themselves students of Gandhi and adopted nonviolence as means in their fight for human rights and freedom. Now I would like to give you a brief introduction into the life and work of Aung San Suu Kyi and the Saffron Revolution in Myanmar. Aung San Suu Kyi's father, Aung San, was the leader of Burma from 1943 to 1947. He was assassinated by his rivals, the military, in 1947. His daughter, Aung San Suu Kyi, was born in 1945 in Burma and went for university studies to Oxford, India and later also to the US. She lived for a long time in England and made it her life's mission to carry on the work of her father. Her father wanted Burma to become an independent country with a proper educational and social system. After the socialists, the military took over in 1962, which led to a lot of oppression in the country. Aung San Suu Kyi became the voice of the opposition and demanded the oppressive dictatorship to step down. In turn, she was put under house arrest several times and was not allowed to communicate with the outside world, including her own family. Her isolation led to an enormous international solidarity campaign, which involved ordinary people as well as head of states. The solidarity campaign included the boycott of trade with Myanmar, as the country was renamed by now, and pressure on the military regime to return to democracy. In 2007, mainly Buddhist monks but also ordinary people went onto the streets in Ragoon, 
the capital of Myanmar, in order to demonstrate their disagreements with the military regime. This became internationally known as the Saffron Revolution. The demonstration went on peacefully by the protesters, just as demanded by Aung San Suu Kyi, although the military reacted with violence. As a result, she was released from house arrest in 2010 and was allowed by the military regime to involve herself actively in politics. Presently, she wants for presidentship and has good chances to win the elections. Just as her father, Aung San Suu Kyi, is a great admirer of Mahatma Gandhi and tried to apply the values Gandhi stood for in her own political and social struggle, as well as in her personal life. Gandhi and Aung San Suu Kyi had in common that they were imprisoned for long periods and that they were educated in India and in the UK and could communicate in English easily. In addition, both were respected by their countrymen as patriots because they dedicated their lives to their countries. Furthermore, the common means and ends were democracy, respect for human rights, reconciliation, nonviolence, personal and collective discipline. Now I'm answering my leading question. In my opinion, Gandhi's strategies are not limited to India's independence movement in the 20th century. As various examples show, they can be applied at different times and in other geographical regions as well. If nonviolence is understood as a way of life and not just a mere tactic, it can be used irrelevant of time and space. I'm ending my presentation with the following quote by Mahatma Gandhi. The world of tomorrow will be, must be, a society based on nonviolence. It may seem a distant goal, an unpractical utopia, but it is not in the least unobtainable since it can be worked for here and now. An individual can adopt the way of life of the future, the nonviolent way, without having to wait for others to do so. And if an individual can do it, cannot whole groups of individuals? I have nothing new to teach the world. Truth and nonviolence are as old as the hills. All I have done is to experiment in both on a vast scale. This was a quote by Mahatma Gandhi in 1936. The leading question of my presentation today is Gandhi's successful policy of nonviolence, only a strategy for India in the 20th century or a model for contemporary conflicts. The presentation is structured into the following three topics. The first topic is an introduction to the life and work of Mahatma Gandhi. The second one, the Salt March, an exemplary campaign for Gandhi's nonviolent fight for independence. And the third topic, Gandhi's nonviolent methods related to a current political conflict. Mohandas Karamchat Gandhi was born on the 2nd October 1869 in Porbanda, a small town in the West Indian state of Gujarat. He is popularly known as Mahatma. Mahatma is a title conferred to him by the Indian people when he was in his mid-40s. were confronted with, he stayed at the end for 21 years in South Africa. As a lawyer, he took up the cause of the Indian contract laborers, who were treated badly by the whites. There, he came in contact with publications of Thoreau, Ruskin and Tolstoy, and developed step by step a theoretical and practical lifestyle of truth and nonviolence. In addition, he founded the Phoenix Settlement, where members tried to live a simplified life. This was one of Gandhi's first efforts in community life which finally led to the concept of Savodaya, the welfare of all. Moreover, Gandhi understood that social and political changes cannot be solved through violence and terrorism, but by respect of the opponents and negotiations. In India, the tradition of nonviolence is rooted in Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. 
He just called Ahimsa, the absence of violence. Gandhi's thoughts are originated in the Hindu tradition. Truth and nonviolence, which Gandhi called Satya and Ahimsa, are the keystones in Gandhi's philosophies, meaning great soul. His mother was deeply religious and exerted influence on Gandhi quite early. After his school time, Gandhi went to London to study law at the university. At this time, he became a member of the Vegetarian Club and the Theosophical Society and started to be interested in questions about diet and different religions. In 1893, Gandhi went to South Africa for work. Originally, he planned to stay not longer than a year, but because of the discrimination he and his fellow